We finished up in chapter 2 of Malachi uh, after the Lord had dealt with the um, corrupt priests and the people that were saying about the priests, well, they're prospering and they're doing evil and, of course, causing the people really to go astray in, in saying that uh, people that do evil get get pro that they prosper and, and that sort of thing calling evil good and good evil and and then the, the, the then the Lord just speaks through Malachi saying behold I will send my messenger you know um, the need for Messiah the need uh, for the person the work of Jesus Christ and that's where chapter 3 comes on of course beginning with uh, the prophecy of John the Baptist, the one that would prepare the way. I think of in Isaiah chapter 40, it says, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight uh, in the desert a highway uh, for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight in the rough places, uh, uh, plain. And so the idea of John the Baptist was to prepare the way and, and really, what was his ministry? Calling people to repent. That's what chapter 3 really is about, is calling people, uh, you know, in fact, in verse 7, it says, return unto me and I will return unto you. And that's the whole idea. Uh, the people that were uh, discouraged because of leadership that was going on. They, the uh, 100 years after the temple was built and they'd already fallen back into a lot of uh, corrupt practices and, and the Lord is, again, his message is always the same. Just come back to me and I'll, 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 I'll return to you. You return to me, I will return to you. And, and of course, he makes that all available some 500 years later, four, four or 500 years later, when Messiah does come on the scene. And chapter 3 brings it on. Behold, I will send my messenger. And of course, he's talking about John the Baptist. And he will prepare the way before me. Of course, talk, Jesus talking. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, speaking of Jesus, and he certainly did in the Gospels, come to the temple uh, with his covenant, whom you will delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. And Jesus is coming. His first coming. So important his first coming. Because when Jesus, his first coming was that of bringing the sacrifice. We couldn't pay for our sins ourselves. The whole idea of a, of a lamb in the Old Testament, a covering for our sins. Jesus would be this, the lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. And of course, that's uh, what he was called. And so uh, his first coming is that of taking care of sin. And then once sin's taken care of, then his presence within the believer, being born again of the Holy Spirit, Jesus residing in our very hearts. And of course, Paul would say to the Philippians, uh, Jesus Christ being in us both the will and to do his good pleasure. You see, without the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we can't do his good pleasure. We have to be, and of course, that for us, that means repentance, brokenness, surrender, uh, continuously, daily, under the spirit of grace. God is always right. <laughs> we don't have to try to rationalize. We don't have to try to live some little sort of legalistic system, you know, and doing that externally when inside our hearts, you know, deceitfully wicked above all things we can know and, and, and doing our own thing. We need to surrender every day to the Lord. What is your will, Lord? And then to surrender to it. And, and of course, with the power of the spirit, we can, we can please God. Uh, you know, what pleases God is, you know, Jesus said, what pleases God is to believe on him whom you have sent, to put our trust on Jesus Christ. He is our provision. He is our provider. Well, verse 2 says, <clears throat> But who may bi abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap, speaking of really of second coming, after he, after he comes first to uh, provide for us salvation and the power of the Holy Spirit, he'll come the second time uh, to with his refiner's fire. And of course, uh, technically, even his first coming, the refiner's fire and the fuller soap, God's working in us again 
uh, both to do will and do his good pleasure and keep us on track. And he shall sit like a refiner and the purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi, purge them uh, like gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. Speaking in a general sense of Israel uh, as a nation will be refined through the tribulation. Those that have come to Christ, he's a refiner, refining fire in us. And, you know, he takes us through the fires as silver. And when, you know, when we're purified enough, he's able to see his own reflection. You know, if you see uh, molten metal or, or silver, and once the, the, the dross is burnt off, it, it, it remains shiny and, 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 the, and the Lord can see his own reflection in us. And, and that's what he needs to see. Um, and we will be taken through trials. We're going through some tremendous trials right now, aren't we? And in with, uh, uh, you know, the corruption that's going on in the world and in, in our governments and the, the battles and the wars that are going on in the Middle East right now and the, the attacks of Hamas and, the, and literally and potentially World War III, Russia and China and North Korea and, and uh, Hamas and Iran and so forth. It's, 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 it's crazy, but we, you know, and, and of course our whole economy, I, I can't, uh, I, I'm just blown away by the cost of everything. Everything's double and sometimes triple uh, what it was two, two, three years ago before COVID. And it's just crazy, the, the trials that we've been going through. But God wants to purge us. God wants to purify us. That's what it's all about. It's not about this world. You know, don't hold on to this world. This world is, is, is quickly passing away. And only those things that, that are wrought in us of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, those are the things that are going to remain uh, to the glory of God. And so, uh, you know, he's the one that, uh, that, that is offering unto us righteousness, as it says in verse 3. And then shall the offering of Judah and the Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near to you judgment, and I will be swift witness against the sorceries and against the adulterers and against the false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless that turn aside the sojourner from his right and fear not me, says the Lord of hosts. And think of this, the sorceries and the adulteries and and, and, and those that oppress, uh, those that, that, that are poor and, and the widows and the orphans, uh, God hates that. God loves the widows and the orphans. God loves the meek and the lowly. And you know what? What does a man gain if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? I mean, if you're the richest man, who cares? If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing, and you'll spend eternity in hell. We need Jesus Christ. We need him working in our lives. And, and the Lord will deal with the adulterers, the saucers. It's an interesting word, saucers. Pharmakia, uh, the idea of uh, those that dabble in witchcraft. And of course, the Bible is clear. Um, uh, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. And, and God hates rebellion. And, and we don't need to rebel. We need to repent. And of course, he, he finishes up in verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Judah are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. There's always that rebellion, always that rejection of the Lord. And then he says, return unto me and I will return unto you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, in what way shall we return? And then he'll go into what way in particular. Uh, he's already called them out on their adulteries and, and their uh, you know, mistreating widows and orphans and stealing and robbing from others that can't protect themselves. And of course, the sorceries, ultimately the, the rebellion of the, of the heart. And, but, but God's calling us all to return to him. I don't care where you are. I don't care who you are. Uh, without Jesus, you're nothing. We're nothing without the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just need to return to him. And if you're a Christian, you've been walking with the Lord, you know, and if you're really honest with yourself, every day is a day of repentance, isn't it? You get off track and you've got to return to him. And what a beautiful place. He's, he's open-armed with us. He loves us. Uh, if we sin 
If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, literally, Christianity is that a, a, is a continuous returning unto the Lord and, and seeing him, his manifest presence in our lives in so many marvelous ways, seeking to do his will, to keep his word. It's so important. We can't do it without it. That's the point. So we need Jesus. We need him. Um, and he says now specifically what way to return. And he says, will a man rob, rob God? And of course, again, 100 years from the time of the temple, they were using their monies for themselves, building their own houses and, and that sort of thing. And, and, and you know, maybe getting given a pittance to the Lord, if, if anything at all. And he says, you're robbing me. How have you robbed me? In your tithes and your offerings there in verse 8. And where's that tenth part? Now, the reality is, you know, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, it, it says in the Psalms. God owns everything. God owns us. God, everything we have, God's given us. It belongs to him. And according to the law, he just, he desires that the first 10% of our increase just be given back to him to support the ministry. To, you know, in that day to support the synagogue or the temple. To this day to support what? The church, the ecclesia. Or, you know, that pastor that's, you know, weekly grinding out and, and, and crushing the grain and, and bringing forth the bread to feed the flock of God. We're to support him. We're to support the church. We're to keep the ministry going. And we can give to, uh, give our 10%. Uh, we really, really can give more than that. We don't have to be just limited to 10%. We can give more than that and just give to God to keep the work of God going. Uh, and of course, as you know, the church is so, so, is in so desperate need. Now, we're all part of the church if we're a Christian. And we're supporting the leadership of, of uh, and, and hopefully you're plugged into a, a Bible teaching church. You're supporting that church as, as the pastor's uh, laboring to feed you and the leadership's taking care of your spiritual needs. You're to support that ministry. And there's other ministries, you know, all over the world uh, that we can be supporting uh, that are primarily teaching the Word of God and ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's important. Will a, uh, will a man rob God, yet how have you robbed me? In your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me this whole nation. You know what? God, you know, we will experience curse. I know that before in, in the old days, when, when I was a, even when I was a Christian and didn't tithe, I, I, I struggled financially. It wasn't until I, I realized, hey, I need to tithe. I need to give my money to the Lord and to the work of the Lord. And then, man, God totally changed my whole financial, uh, my life, our lives. We, you know, he blessed us in so many ways. And then he goes on to say, uh, that, you know, bring your tithes, uh, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and test me now, here and with I saith uh, the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing, th that there shall not be room enough to receive it. In other words, this is one place that God says you can challenge me. How's that? Give your, give your tithes and see if I will not bless you. Bless you financially, bless you in so many ways. Now, God wants to bless us. That's the point. He, he loves us. He, he's, he's a good father. He wants to bless us. But if we're being stingy, we're being, and of course, uh, the, you know, being stingy with your finances is an indication how, that you're stingy in other areas, that you're maybe wandering into, into that area, that rebellion or sorceries or, you know, being, you know, ex, being an extortioner of the poor and the widows. You know, you're ripping God off. I mean, if you're ripping God off, who else are you ripping off? That's the point. You know, and so we need to just <laughs> realize, God, you have blessed me in so many ways. It all belongs to you. I'm going to, I just, as an act of obedience and trust, I'm just going to give you that 10% and, uh, and more if, you know, if you can, that sort of thing. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sins. Notice that. Not only will he bless you, you can't, you know, you can't outgive God is the point. What's he saying in verse 10? I will, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. 
you know, those things that are ripping you off, I will take care of that. Neither uh, shall your vine cast its fruit before the time of the field, the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you blessed. Notice you'll get, you, you, you know, you'll have that um, that witness and people will, will just see the blessing of God in your lives. And and, uh, and all the nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts, speaking, of course, for Israel. Your words have been uh, stout against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what way have we spoken so much against you? You have said in vain to serve God. And, and what profit is it that you have kept his ordinance? And in what way have you walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we shall call the proud happy, yea, the wicked uh, wickedness set up, and they will test God, are delivered again. God calling them out once again, uh, telling them, hey, I'll bless you. You can't outgive me. I'll take care of the devourer. But, you know, you're saying it's vain to serve God. It's empty. No. God said, I promise you, I'll take care of you. Just put your trust in me. Return unto me and I'll return unto you. That's the point, you see. Then in verse 16, it says, Then they that feared the Lord spoke often to one another, and the Lord hearkened uh, and heard it, and the book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and that, and that thought upon his name, fearing the Lord, thinking upon the Lord, and they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, and that day when I make them, notice, he'll make them up my jewel, and I will spare, I will spare them as a man spares his own. Uh, son that serves him, and then shall you return, discern between righteousness and wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. God says, you're my jewel. I want to bless you. I want to I wanna provide for you. I want to care for you. Let me do that. I'm your dad. I'm your Abba. I'll take care of you. Surrender yourselves to me. And that's the key, man, to, to, to living an abundant, prosperous life. It's just surrendering to the Lord it's and, and, and allowing God to, to be responsible for us. He, he, he is. I mean, he owns it all anyway. <laughs> we can do this easier. We can do this hard. But I'll tell you, it's best to surrender to the Lord each and every day. Spend time with him. Uh, love on him and, and let him love on you. In Jesus' name, amen.